Hello there, I'm Justin Wilson. And what I love most about Cajun cooking is the imagination that goes into it. Although some Cajuns are rich as thick cream, most of them don't have the money to buy fancy cuts of meat and high-priced vegetables. That's where imagination comes in. Down through the centuries, the Louisiana Cajun, like his French cousin or cousins, had learned to improvise using the less expensive meats and vegetables in their cooking. Cajuns cook a lot of chicken, pork, cheap cuts of beef, and lamb. As well as game, they kill only for food, not for pretty trophies to decorate the walls. When my first series on Cajun cooking aired nearly 25 years ago, I was proud to share my stories and my recipes for cooking inexpensive cuts of meat. I like beef shanks, only I cooked them the newfangled way in a plastic cooking bag. Where the recipe calls for sauterne wine, you can use your favorite dry white wine, and it'll taste like a little bit of heaven, I guarantee. Hi, y'all are. I'm glad for you to see me, I guarantee. And I want to tell you a story to start this thing off with right now, because you know, I love the game of football. No question about that. When I hear a good football story, no matter what time of year it is, I like to tell that story. In South Louisiana, and Louisiana, the whole state of Louisiana, like in other states, I guess, all over the country, in a high school, when you win district, well, then you got to play another district to see who goes to the quarterfinals. And then they go on. But the way they do is in, in Louisiana, when, the, when they play to the, see who can go to the quarterfinals, if the score is tie tie at the end of the game, they don't go no sudden death, and they don't uh, play the game over again. All they do is count the number first down. If the number first down is tie tie, they count the number of penetrates into each other's territory. And if that's tie tie, they flip a coin, my just as well, and I'd have played the doggone game. <laughs> well, last year in South Louisiana, there was a team on the east bank of the Mississippi River, Wind District, and a team on the west bank, Wind District, also, too, and they got to play off to see who goes to the quarterfinal. Well, the team on the east bank was supposed to just have the very best team in the whole state going to win state. And the team on the West Bank, everybody wondered how in the world it gotten to the playoff in the second place, you know? Well, they hauled off there and they played the, the playoff. Well, man, I want to tell you, that team that was supposed to win going away don't did that. They don't make no score at all to the third quarter and finally make a touchdown, six nothing, make extra point, seven nothing. But the game ain't over, no. That other team on the other side of the river there, the West Bank, they ain't wasn't even supposed to be in the same ballpark with these people. In the fourth quarter, two minutes, ten seconds left to play, they make a touchdown, six points. And they make the extra point, seven, seven, tie, tie, right there. Well, that coach counting number first down real quick. Fifteen, fifteen. He counted number of penetrates into each other's territory, and he's ahead by one penetrate. Well, that team kick off the hem, you know, and the ball going to the hen zone. They bring it out to the 20-yard line. That little quarterback run one play, get back to the line of scrimmages, call timeout, and he come running out there holding his chunking arm where it's bending in the four places where it ain't supposed to, you know? <laughs> and the coach said, what in the world do you mean calling timeout at a time like this? He said, coach, my chunking arm, I think it's broken about four places. He said, you would did something like that right now when we need you real bad. And he asked his backfield coach, where that second string quarterback? He said, he's home in bed with the fluenza. <laughs> he said, we got a third string quarterback? He said, oh, yeah. He said, where he is? Oh, he said, he's right over here. He said, what his name is? He said, Lejeune. He said, Lejeune, broad yourself, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lejeune, run up there. He said, Lejeune, you listen to me in good, you hear? And you better did what I told you, because if you don't, I'm going to tear your head off. You understood, boy? I'm going to throw it at you, too. I'm going to kill you if you don't do it. <gasps> yes, sir. He said, all right, I want you to go in the first play, hand off to the fullback. The second play, you pitch to the tight end. The third play, you kick that ball. You punt that ball, you hear? He said... Yes, sir. And he started, he said, wait a minute, Lejeune, what I told you. He said, you said you're going to kill me. He said, I ain't talking about that. What I'm talking about is 
what I'm told you to did, he said, first play, hand to the fullback, second play, pitch to the tight end, third play, ah, kick that ball, punt that ball. He said, that's right, and don't you forgot. No, sir. He run out there in the first play, hand off to the fullback. He run 60 yards to the other 20 yard line. The second play, pitch to the tight end, he run 15 yards to the five yard line. First down, five yards to go for a touchdown. One minute, five seconds left to play, and he kicked the ball out of the stadium. <laughs> Coach said, time, time, I said, damn it, time. Lejeune brought yourself, yeah. Come on, Lejeune, I'm not gonna hurt you no more. Come on, Lejeune. The old Lejeune run up there. He said, Lejeune, do you realize you're on the five-yard line? First down, goal to go, one minute, five seconds left to play, and you kick that ball out of the stadium. He said, yes, sir, I realize. He said, what in the world were you thinking? He said, I was thinking we had the dumbest coach in the world, I guarantee. <laughs> you know, now, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some cooking. I'm gonna cook in a bag. You know, this new bag bit is real good. That's a cooking bag. A clear plastic bag for cooking. You can see in it. It has its advantages. It really does have. It cooks your stuff in about a third less time and uh, cooks it better and it browns more evenly. It, it, it amazed me the first time I ever cooked in that, I guarantee. Now, you also you have some things you've got to be careful about. Never cook in one of these bags unless you put some flour inside. I'm going to do that in just a little bit. Also, too, what you got to do, you got to punch some holes in there with a two-time fork. Twelve holes is what I always put in them. And never cook over 350 degrees or 375. Never over 300. 350, I recommend. Now, I'm, what I'm going to cook in here, First of all, I'm going to spray a little bit of Pam, just in case I get a leak on there. I don't want to have a hard time uh, getting this thing cleaned up, you know. Put that on there. Then put my bag, get open it like that, and I'm going to cook some quail right now in here. Quail in a bag, look at that. Hmm. I got two little trays of stuff I got to have to put on that, too. It's going to be good. Like I'm told you, I'm gonna put about a tablespoon full of flour in this bag. Put a little more. I'm gonna shake the bag up. Get that flour all over it. That's what you do. Put that all over there like that. Put the flour, scatter it around on the bottom so it won't be in one spot and get all gooey. Now, what I'm gonna did is salt and pepper these quail. I got six quail I'm gonna put on there. Put salt and pepper them and put them in the bag. There we go. Salt and red pepper. I do not use black pepper except for garlic bread. Ooh, that's pretty quail. Like that Cajun say, you know, quail will play in the dust all the time. They really will. And he said, did you ever see them quails swimming in the dust, huh? And that's what they look like they're doing when they're swimming in the dust. A little salt, a little red pepper. Put that on there. A little red pepper. Cross them up and then put that red, red pepper first. A little salt. Just an ordinary amount of salt. You don't put any more than, than uh, you would for anything else. Oh, I got eight quails here. Isn't that nice? No, no, it's just six. Seven, somebody miscounted. Three, four, eight, that's what I got. That's fine, one for me. I don't have to do like my mother used to say, FHB, that meant family hold back. <laughs> and then she'd come sailing out and say, M-I-K, cheering. That meant more in the kitchen. And we always were so glad to hear that M-I-K, I guarantee. Ooh, boy, look at that. Don't that nice? 
a little red pepper on each one. You want each one to taste about the same. Now you're going. I'm putting them with the breast up so it'll brown pretty. These will quail you. Oh, my goodness alive. Look out, don't drop nothing there. Didn't did it. Red pepper. Salt. Who you kidding? Put it on there like that. Now, I got to put them other stuff what I got here to go on there. I got here some onion. One cup of onion. Chop up real fine. Spread that over that real good. Read the bag up. See? Bag got a lot of good things you can did with that. Then I got one half cup of bell pepper. Sweet pepper, some people call it, not knowing it's shaped like a bell. And I got a half a cup of dried parsley. Now, if you put regular parsley, put a cup. I mean, uh, fresh parsley. Now, I got four little cloves of garlic. Well, chop up. They're four cloves. Chop up, not too fine, but just right. Put that on there. We want to get all them garlic on there. Over here, some citron, lemon, lemon. The Cajuns call it limon. The French people call it citron. They don't know no better, you know. Now, I got a pound of mushroom I'm going to put on that. These have been cleaned, soaked in a little salt water to be sure all the bugs got out of them. And put that on there like this. You talk about good, man. Whole pound. Whether you like mushroom or not, they're good. Put them on there like that. There we go. Now, what I'm gonna do is pour some water on here. Just like this. Hmm. And put some, a cup of sauterne wine on the whole doggone thing. Now that's fine. I guarantee, and I got a little tie right here to tie that up. I tell you what I better did, put a little more salt. Put a vegetable, what you put on there. That's why you put that on there, because you got to have enough salt. Get this bag, tie them up real good. You were a nun bag. Gotcha. You put your tie on tight. Take your two tie and fork, what I'm talking about. And you put your hole. Uh, one, two, three, four. Don't put them on the side. You don't want that juice to get out of there. One, two, three, four. Uh, duh, trois, cut. A French lesson, two on top of it. Now I'm going to put this in a 350 degree oven right this minute. Go ahead and cook, you pretty little old quail, you. Whoo, boy, now, let me get this out of my way because I got something else I want to do right now. I guarantee, speaking of quails, I got to tell you that story of my friend was got what he said is the very best bird dog in the world. He went to Gonzales, Louisiana one day and he met another friend, he said, look, I got the very best bird dog in the world. He say real good, he say the best. When he point, there's a quail there. There's a Bob White. They got to be, I'll bet anything I got, there's a Bob White quail there, partridge. About that time, here come a little boy walking down the road. That dog went on a dead point, a little boy. And his friend laughed and said, there ain't no quail, that's a boy. He said, I bet he got a quail in his pocket. He said, son. The boy said, what you want? He said, you got a quail in your pocket? No. He said, you have quail for lunch? No. Your papa raised quail and you help him clean those quail, cage it out, huh? No. He said, son, what's your name? He said, Bob White. <laughs> oh, right now, I'm going to cook what is uh, considered a very cheap cut of meat. But I want to tell you, it's a very good. Get all this out of here so I won't miss nothing. No. This is shank bone. 
the lower part of the leg of that old heifer cow. That's what it is. I'm going to put on this. Right now, I got this. I've already pre-sprayed my pan, my pan with some Pam. And I'm going to put a tablespoonful of flour, like I'm told you supposed to did, in my bag. A little bit more than that, actually. And I'm going to shake it up to be sure, like I'm told you, it gets spread out real good. Hmm. Then I spread it some more to be sure it's kind of even like in the bottom. Yep. Now, I got them shank bone over here. You see that shank bone? That's the, the cheapest cut of meat you can get. And salt and pepper that with red pepper and salt. Now, I know it look like a lot of salt, but remember, we're going to put a lot of vegetable in there with that. And I'll tell you good. Ooh, I cut my finger in the wine. Let's see. Yeah, that wine. Red pepper. That doesn't, you know, people say, oh, red pepper, that's hot. Nothing hot than black pepper. Just depends on how much you use, that's all. Oh, man. Red pepper. Get them on down. Now I'm going to put them on, on the bag. See that? Right inside the bag, like that. Like that. Now these are cut three, this one happened to be four inches. This one don't know how tall it is. And that's all I'm going to put in there because I want to have plenty of room for everything else. Now, I'm going to haul off now and put, these are carrots, about 12 medium-sized carrots that we had scraped. We're going to put that over that, spread it all over, see? Oh, man. Spread real good. Not only is it good, but it looks pretty, too. I guarantee if I can just get it out of my way. I've got some onion. Small onions you can have, a medium. But these were big, so I cut them in half. And I got some potato I'm gonna put on here too. Whoo, you kid. Potato. You talk about good. Your whole dinner's cooked right in this one bag. That's what's so good about this. Along with a little rice, there's nothing you can beat with that. I'll tell you for true. Just get at it. Now, this bell pepper just quartered. I'll put them on there, spread them all over so it'll look pretty, as well as get that seasoning all over the thing. Oh, man. Come on there, bell pepper. Get on there. Isn't that nice? Whew. That was three medium-sized bell pepper, what we cut up and did like that. Now, this is a can of Rotel, what I done chop up real fine so that I can spread it all over there. Now, Rotel, when you put, you notice I didn't put too much of them red pepper on there because Rotel got a hot with itself, you know? Got a hot with itself there. I'm gonna put that on there. And I'm gonna put a little garlic too. You know, I'm in such a habit of not putting garlic until I got a little juice, I automatically wait until I get the Rotel in there. That's, that's just a little, oh, I guess four or three garlic chopped up there. Now, what I'm going to do is put this sauteing wine in this little bowl what I got here. This is bitters. Pecho bitters. Not Angostura, no. Pecho. And I'm going to put, there's a difference in taste. If you want to, to cook with Angostura bitters, you did that. That's just fine. But I like to cook with Pecho because I like the way it tastes and smells. And you got to watch what you did with this, too. You hear yeah, now, you this we got that much stuff there. I'm gonna put a half a teaspoon. That's plenty enough. All the way plum is plenty enough. Okay. Rinse that in that good wine. Soy sauce, I got here. I'm gonna put on this. What I'm gonna do? That's two cups of sauteed wine, what I put in there, by the way. I'm gonna haul on and put a whole tablespoon full of soy sauce in there. I may even run it over, there ain't no telling. 
But that soy sauce, you know, that's the base of Worcestershire sauce. That's what it is. All the world it is. Now just look around here and tell you, uh oh, and run it over. A little more. Wrench my spoon right down there in that. Now, I got some Worcestershire sauce. Little piece of garlic. I don't want to left that, man. That's the flavor I just put in there. Now, we're going to put this, oh, a couple of tablespoons full of Worcestershire sauce. Just put it on there like that. There ain't enough there left to keep. I just put it all. <laughs> all right. Now, all I'm going to did is just stir this up a little bit with the wine. I got it in the wine. Also, too, I uh, think you need just a little more salt on all them vegetables. I didn't know we had that many. Put them on there like that. Take this wine. Hmm. Pour it over the whole mess. And you talk about good, <laughs> man, I guarantee. And that's the cheapest cut of meat, like I'm told you. You weren't wasting it, eh? No, got it all on there. Now, got my tie. I never forget that kid you went with me and asked that little girl in the chicken place where you get all the chicken you want to eat for three dollars and a half, and he done ate all he had. And, and he said to the little waitress, bring me a wing and a tie. She said, what you said? She's from up north around Shreveport. He said, bring me a wing and a tie. And she looked at me and said, what did he say? I said, he wants a wing and a tie. <laughs> I thought she was going to hit me in the head. <laughs> now, I still got to make them whole. Don't forget, you got to always make them whole. Make them on the top where they don't, tell me they don't run out. One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Well, didn't do good there. Got twelve and a half there. Gonna put this in the oven right now. I'm gonna open the door so I won't stand a chance of dropping that. And I'm gonna put that in there. It's 350 degrees. Now, the quail will take about an hour to cook. This will take a little longer, about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. What you got to do is watch and see if the onions are done. They take longer to cook than the meat. Now, that's a funny thing, but it's true, absolutely true. And right now, though, I'm going to go over there and sit down at the table, serve my plate. <laughs> oh, look, yeah. I just happen to have this fixed. Ain't that nice? I guarantee. A little rice with the shank bone and the quail. Put a little rice there. Take my knife right here on my fork. See, that, that bone just comes right off from the meat. There's the shank bone. Cooked right there. Get a little gravy. I use a little spoon there to get a little gravy on that. It's so good. Get a bell pepper. Oh, my goodness, and a cooked onion. And a potato, a potato. A little more gravy, just in case. Got that there. Go over here and get one little old quail. That's all I'm going to get, just one. Get a quail, put him here. Mushrooms. Oh, yeah. Put that there like that. A little bit of them juice to cover them quail. Put a little on my rice while I'm at it. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Now, you know that hot pepper got in my nose there, then. Whoo, I guarantee. That'll clear you sciences up, I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> Sit myself down here and pour myself just a little bit of wine. I tell you right now, I got three friends been worked together for many, many years. And all of them been worked together in construction down there near Baton Rouge there. Families don't know each other, some none at all, any, because they go to different schools. One live in French settlement, one live in Maripal, one live in, in Frost. But these men been working together all these years. And one day they would come back from work, and they stop and get a bunch of them, uh, Jacques Daniel whiskey, that good Cajun whiskey made up in Tennessee. 
they get that, and they fall drunk. One of them gets too drunk to sing, so he's got to drive. And he drive that car. Road turn, he don't need to hit one of them lovely live oak trees. Two of them don't get a scratching. The third one will just say his name was Boudreaux, kill him dead all the way plumb. One of them say, he's dead. The other one say, I know this dad. <laughs> what are we going to do about it? He said, wonder what you did about that. He said, nothing to do about that. Oh, yeah, you got to call the sheriff, the state police, the coroner, and you can't let me. You got to go to the funeral home or somewhere. Somebody got to told his old lady, you know Miss Boudreaux? No, I don't know her. I can't do anything like that, too. He said, well, I know her. I'm broke out with tack. I'll go to her. He said, okay, you go to her. I'll do everything else. Took your tack and get going. Well, he took his tack and he went to Boudreaux's house. And then French settlement, flap, 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 knock on the door. This lady brought us up to the door and he looked at her and said, are well, you the widow Boudreaux? <laughs> she said, I'm Miss Boudreaux, but I ain't no widow. He said, the hell you ain't. <laughs> oh, this is fine. I guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. 